Welcome to eKnowHow. In this video, we will look at how a CMOS output buffer is designed. So, before uh, talking about output buffers, let's let's talk about normal inverters or gates. Say, for example, you have you have a NAND gate. So, let me draw an, a NAND gate here with two inputs, say A and B. And now, usually, the NAND gate is connected to up to 4x of the same size capacitance so that uh, say for example it goes to four other similarly sized NAND gates. The output of the first NAND gate will go to four other NAND gates just to give you an example. So you got three and then I put the fourth one here. So now what happens is if you have a transition uh, at A or B for example so you have um, falling edge on B, for example. So your output goes high here. And now if you really plot it with respect to time, so I'll take the input. So the input, say, falls like this with respect to time. And then your output, your output is low here and then it starts raising and it goes high like this and now this now what is the load on this load you have four four nand gates as load now if i add more say if i add six for example you would see that the output would actually take longer to rise and so i may be exaggerating here but as you keep increasing the load uh, the load capacitance on the gate output, this uh, the the output slope would increase, so it'll take longer to longer for it to rise to VDD level. So now let's do one thing here. So the output buffers, so it doesn't matter that any gate within a digital circuit, you usually have the loading issue. So CL, CL, if it increases beyond a certain point, you will have problems. So to keep the transition time in check or the, the rise time or the transition time in check, what you do is you limit the CL. So CL will be limited to say 4x of the gates, for example. So you won't, you won't load it more than 4. You won't go to a loading of 6 in the circuit. But now let's look at output buffers. What output buffers are supposed to do is, output buffer is something that drives a pad. So output buffer is nothing but an inverter. You can take a huge inverter, say huge inverter. So the W is mega W, W max, so over some L, WP max, and WN max over L. I just wrote max just saying that it's a huge device because this is supposed to drive, say for example, your pad, the output pad is driven with this and then this output pad is bonded to the pin on the IC and then this could be the pin on the IC it's bonded to the pin on the IC and then this is connected to an external uh, there is a huge capacitance on this one so even here there could be huge capacitance so it has to drive large capacitances so that is what the output buffer is supposed to do but now how do we design it? Now let's assume you just had an inverter and you have a rise, rising edge here. So this side is supposed to fall. So now what, what it does is basically you need, to, you need to short this capacitance to ground or discharge this capacitance towards ground using this, the, the R on of the end channel device. R on of the in-channel device and then you got all the C here so C1, C2, many C's here and you add up all the C's to get your final C the time constant is T is R on that C ends so n-channel multiplied by the total C but that's not the issue what we are talking about here now when this you have a rising edge here this P channel this P channel is switching off. It was on before and then this, cha this N channel 
is just now switching on to discharge the output. Now what happens is this end channel not only has to sync the, the current from the capacitance from the output this way, it also has to sync the current from the P channel till it turns off. So that is a waste of current. So this current, what we are talking about, that is just wasting the current. So the output buffer is intelligently designed such that so whatever transistor is turning off will go off first. So the off happens first and then on happens. So this is the this is how it happens. So for example, on a rising edge at the input, the P turns off, P off, and then N on. So this is on at the rising edge of the input. Now if you see a falling edge at the input, at the falling edge of the input, so first the N turns off, so the N off, and then the P turns on. So how do you design this? So if you look at this here, so now we have looked at the delay cell already. So now if you take this, for example, you take an AND gate and you add a delay cell here, a CMOS delay cell. Please look at that video for CMOS delay cell and you have an AND gate. And now this is in and this is out. Now if we plot in and out, say in, say I put a square waveform here at the in. And now we also plot this signal which is the delayed input. So let me use a different color. So the delayed input would look like this. It's basically delayed version of the input. I may be exaggerating it because I'm, but so now if you look at the output it's an AND of this and this. So now the output will not go high till the delayed signal goes high, but it would go low when the input goes low. So what happened here is effectively we got a delay. See, you got a delay on the rising edge, you got a delay on the falling edge, it occurred at the same time. So if you look at the falling edge, it occurred at the same time. But for the rising edges, you introduced a delay. So you introduced a rising edge delay here. And now, how do we introduce a falling edge delay? Rising edge delays, is you can use it for the N-channel device. So you delay the turning on of the N-channel device. Now how do you introduce a falling edge delay? So for introducing a falling edge delay, what we can do is we can take the input here, again have a delay cell with the same delay D, for example, and now you feed these two to an OR gate instead of an instead of an AND gate. So this is the out, this is the out, this is out one, I'll call this out one, out two. So now if you plot again the same thing here. So if you have input doing this and then the, the, the delayed signal here at this point is this. You have delay on both edges. So now um, if you look at the output which is an OR of these two signals. So what happened is now if I plot the output, it would go high when one of the signals goes high. So it goes high when the first input goes high and then, but on the falling edge, it will remain high till the delayed signal went low. So now what happened is you introduced a delay, the rising edges line up here. If you see the rising edges, they line up, but you introduced a delay on the falling edge so introduced a delay on the falling edge. So this can be, this is a falling edge delay. Falling edge delay. And then this can be used for the P-channel device because falling edge is what, 
falling edges what turns on the p-channel device. So now if you can use these two, this technique, and so, so our output buffer schematic would look like this now. You have the huge P and N channel devices here. I'm sorry, I need to make it an N channel. So this is the N channel device. This is the output. It's VDD and ground. So now for the P channel, we said we took the input and we introduced a delay the input and then we have an R gate here and we have an AND gate here. So now the delayed signal goes here to one of the inputs and the input goes directly here. The input goes here so this is in this is in D in delay and then same thing here this is in delay and this is in and now you generated two different signals we can call this P gate and we can call this signal N gate and these two signals if you see P gate has a falling edge delay whereas N gate has a rising edge delay so this will make sure the device that needs to turn off first goes off first and then the the one that is turning on so will turn on later so then what happens is if you see now if you go and put the capacitance here on the output here the capacitance now if you are discharging you only have current flowing this way you only have current flowing this way because you turned off you turned on the n channel after the p channel turned off so this turns off first and then the n channel turns on so there is no there is no current uh, there is no what we call the crowbar current so there is it's just from the output it discharges now if you look at the other side where the p channel needs to turn on so the n channel goes off first which was shorting the output capacitor to ground that goes off first and then the P channel turns on so now the current is only going from the P channel into the capacitor to charge it so there is no there is no current going this way so like in a normal inverter when it's switching there is a current so now this current we eliminated because these are huge devices what we said is this P channel here the speed channel and these end channel are big devices to drive large capacitances. So that's how an output buffer, a CMOS output buffer is designed.